Hey everybody, it's Brian Burns. Welcome to this episode of the Brutal Truth About Sales and Selling podcast. Hey, it's the middle, and I hope it's the middle of the summer. Got some beautiful weather, and boy, you know, I talked about the summer, you know, change. Some people call it a slowdown. Some people call it vacation season. But boy, did it really affect me uh, this week. Uh, you know, I had like nine interviews planned and got, uh, I think, four done. Some flaked, some forgot that they were on vacation, some were on vacation and thought they could call in <laughs> from a cell phone and I had, oh, quality counts. I'm really trying to get the quality of the sound better and better, um, you know, but you got to understand I'm interviewing people who do not get interviewed as a profession, not like me. But uh, it it's just goes to show you, I mean, this is all with great planning, great uh, reminders, great uh, triple reminders, uh, FAQs, all of that. And still, this is what happens. And it's just the time of the year. And it shows um, really kind of human nature and that people don't really block out that time. Uh, and kind of think it'll all work out for the best. But enough about me. This week, we're going to talk about ownership and really owning it. Because, it, you know, it, it sounds kind of whiny, but in sales, we're between a rock and a hard place. Uh, you know, the rock is our customers and the hard place is our company. And that is not going to change. And it, I, I've never seen it change. We can try and make it change. And I always thought the best sales managers were the ones that run interference for us, that try and make that hard place not as hard and more effective for us. But, but the thing is, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. You know, all the you can be right, but you can be in the unemployment line and be right. Our job is not to be right. Our job is to go to the bank and make money. And I always used to tell my reps, I go, you want to be right or you want to be rich? And they always gave the same answer. Everybody wants to be rich. And I go, you're already right. You know, the comp plan has issues. The product has issues. Marketing has issues. Operations. The sales prevention team has issues. And our job is to work around it. And, and when I was a manager, I spent probably a good 60% of my time trying to run that interference. But at the end of the day, we, we have to get the deals booked. We have to get the customers what they want. And that's our job. And it's not really service, it's, you know, it's experience. And if we think about it as experience, I think it has a better tone to it. Uh, so we're going to talk about that today. And it kind of dovetails well into the training courses. Listen to the end. I'll update you on the training courses and office hours. Uh, if you're in the courses, make sure you're checking out the office hours because what you'll see is the results that other people are getting. If you're not getting those results, let me know because there's no reason why you shouldn't. And before we get into it, I want to make sure you're checking out PipeDrive. PipeDrive is coming out with great content, lots of research and studies on what's working today in sales. I've talked to their their content team, and they're doubling down. They're asking what do reps care about. So let me know, and I'll share that with them. Uh, but uh, they are doing lots of stuff, and they've been able to see what, what's working for salespeople. And I'm telling all my partners, it's like, see how people are using your product, and let's get the best practices out to the audience so people can understand. Uh, even if the product doesn't make sense for them, it gets you awareness in the marketplace. So if you want to check out PipeDrive, uh, use the coupon code BRUTALTRUTH. You can use that coupon code with Nudge as well. People are getting insane results with Nudge. Uh, daily updates that, you know, I've, I've, I've gotten to the point where I just forward it to my virtual assistant and my, my weeks are booked. Not everyone shows up, but <laughs> the weeks are booked. <laughs> hey, I'm doing the best I can. It's vacation season. What can you expect? <laughs> I literally had somebody this week go, Hey, I'm on vacation. I go, you scheduled it. I didn't, but enough about that. Let's get into the interview. I think it's a fun interview. I love talking with salespeople and understanding what's going on out there. Let's get Ken on the line. Hey, Ken, thanks for joining us today. As a way of getting started, tell us about yourself. Perfect. Well, Brian, I appreciate you having me on. Uh, I guess the, the easy way to say it is I'm a sales consultant and trainer who works directly with companies and I have a lot of cool stuff going on right now, a book coming out and a bunch of trainings that we've been doing across the country. So I've been traveling quite a bit. I'm jealous of you not traveling as much. So you're going to have to tell me how that is at some point, uh, whether or not you get a little bit <laughs> I don't miss it, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, that's, that, that's, that's great. You wrote a great post um, about change. What made it motivate you to do that? 
Yeah, I think, you know, in my time with leadership, so the, the post was titled, whose responsibility is it anyway? Because I think oftentimes when we go into work with sales leaders, entrepreneurs, uh, we hear a lot, you know, I work a lot with companies who are trying to turn around sales. So their sales are slower, they're stagnant, or in some cases, even in this great economy, they've been declining. And so in that environment, I walk into those offices and many times you hear comments like, oh, you know, well, operations has to figure this out. Oh, the delivery team has to figure this out. And so as I've continued to see this trend over and over again, the idea was, OK, that's great. Those things may be true. But whose responsibility within the organization is it to force change? Uh, and my contention is that it's absolutely sales has the responsibility to put so much pressure on the operational team that they must become more efficient for the success of the organization. Now, and the salespeople probably say, well, I tried that. Um, because I run, <laughs> I run into it all the time. I've been that rep. I've been the, and, and I, I hear it all the time. Basically, the reps try to convince you it's impossible to sell the product. And, um, and then the management tries to convince you these reps uh, are the wrong people. And then all of a sudden, there's a stalemate. Um, yeah. How do you work through that? Oh, it's, it's just an amazing question. It's, the hard part about it, so the non-tactical, fluffy part about it, is that it's absolutely a mindset change to start with. You know, they just have to give me 10% of you that says, okay, Ken, maybe that makes sense. And then from there, I think you have to, it really comes down to how you set the cadence and the process and the types of responsibilities, deliverables that are um, coming from the sales force and from sales management. And it's kind of a bi-directional flow. Um, so when we do it, one of the things I tend to find is companies, for some reason, and you've written a number of posts on this that are fantastic, is they, they like to talk about things in quarters, right? This arbitrary calendar, oh, it's first quarter, oh, it's second quarter, oh, it's third quarter. Um, and so that also tends to bleed through to how the sales force thinks they need to perform. Um, and so one of the very first things that we start to do is we start to tighten up the cadence of how they talk and communicate about deal flow and how they talk and communicate and check on each other about what the expectations are. And so we try to move that back from a quarter to making sure that we can prioritize on things that are more immediate, say on the week, and then we move from the week to the month. And so we actually work it so that deals gain priority based on when they can close, not based on size, yeah. which is where enterprise companies get a little bit of a problem. That's it. Everyone gets real comfortable the first month of the quarter. And, and then, then in the, that month's yeah. gone. They spend the whole month in training and uh, planning and reviews and then vacation, like, like what we're running into next week, right? Right, right, yeah. right. And I think and the vacation thing's funny because, you know, in sales, if, if we're, you know, I tend to work with a lot of hunt, hunters. You know, we tend to work with a lot of people who are going out and they're eating what they kill when they sell. And in sales, we, let's be clear. There are plenty of days when salespeople, I think it's the greatest profession in the world, we start at 6 a.m., we go till 10 p.m. There are plenty of those days. But we also choose, part of the reason that happens is we also choose that we can work, you know, well, I'll kind of work half time next week, even though there's no holiday. <laughs> so <laughs> by, by moving things to a more frequent cadence of what's going on, where are we going, what can I do as a sales manager to move this deal forward for you? Um, you tend to see uh, a more consistent flow of sales putting things into the hopper. Yeah, because I've heard a lot of people talking about instead of having goals, having habits, having activities and daily routines, and as you use the word cadence, uh, as a way of building up the team. Is that something that you find more effective than just having some glorious goal? Um, I agree. Yes. I think ultimately, you know, one of the things that I will tell sales professionals, I'll tell sales managers, and it comes down to the simple concept. You need to do the basic blocking and tackling, and then I can help you become a superstar. But if you aren't putting forth just the basic blocking and tackling, I wrote a post and did a video on um, sales skills development. And the idea was it was about the idea of dribbling. So LeBron James is the greatest basketball player in the world. I know some people will say it's Michael Jordan, but the first thing he learned to do before he was strong enough to shoot was he learned to dribble. Today, you know, he's probably still practicing dribbling with his kid in his driveway. But salespeople, for some reason, we lose the idea. We think, oh, I already figured out that front end of the process. Oh, I, 
already figured out how to cold call. So therefore, I don't need to do that any further or practice or refine those skills. Um, and so we get them into the idea that, yes, you have to do the basic blocking and tackling. And then we'll take you from being an above average performer to a rock star. Now, do you get a lot of resistance with that where people say, well, I know that. And there's so much difference between knowing it and doing it. I mean, because you can watch a video <laughs> about dribbling and, oh, yeah, you just hit the ball. It hits the ground. You hit it back. How hard can it be? <laughs> right. 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 As Tony Robbins says, and I take this to and this is kind of the way that I look at this particular process with people. Tony Robbins says, I want to judge you by your walk and not your talk. Yeah. Um, and so. Go ahead and say it. That's fine. But let's make sure that your behaviors are actually showing me that you understand it. So, yes, when we talk about cadence and habits, it's much less important that it's called a cadence or that it's called a habit than that it's clearly defined. You know, so I think when you were actually interviewing, I believe it's Jason Price, the video, he, he talked specifically about defining those expectations. Yeah. And so. As one of the things that's happened over the years, I think sales managers have, are not necessarily as good in general as they used to be because we've gotten so driven by this whole kind of theory of AI and technology and reporting. So when it comes down to the sales manager, I think those expectations have to be clearly set, but they also have to be responsible to their sales force and show them the ways they can remove barriers to help get deals across the line. And, and how do you build that into a daily routine? Have have you come up with something that works for you and that you teach? Sure. Yeah, we've seen, you know, it depends on the organization, but theoretically, you know, we do most of our work with B2B sales organizations who are selling to, you know, anything from a you know, $5,000 a month to a multi-million dollar project. And so when it comes down to the bi-directional communication between a sales manager and the sales staff, you can do something as, um, something as simple as, replace your stand up that you're doing today with your team with something that actually works. <laughs> so <laughs> you can see that you can see there's some skepticism in, in me on what these stand ups look like. Right. Um, and don't get me started on some of the communication platforms that people just use, but that's, I'm, I digress. So you, in your daily cadence, so we've got one particular company that has went to the idea of they put in a 15 minute stand up on Monday. And the only thing that stand up was, is what are the priority? What are what priorities do we have on what deals? Whose responsibility is it to knock out this week? And then on Thursday they have an additional 15 minute stand up where they actually go back and go, okay, what did we say we were going to do on Monday? What's been done? Whose responsibility is it? And if it hasn't been completed, it must be completed by Friday. And that cadence has, has been good for the team. That sounds a lot like um, I don't know if you've gotten John Doerr's book about uh, OKRs. Um, uh -uh. yeah, you should check it out. Um, it, it's kind of the, the same thing where you, you have an objective and then you have the actions that are going to create that objective. And he, his model, which was taken from Intel, uh, and mm -hmm. Andy Grove was about you know, quarterly cadence, which I, yeah. I, I totally get. I think the quarterly thing, you can't really get away from it because it, you know, it trickles down from the CEO who has to go in front of the board every three months yep. or go in front of wall street every three months. And it, it kind of changes the focus and you know, it, it muddies the waters a little bit. But what I always found was when I didn't follow the quarterly thing, I always moved it up one month and I never had yep. anything expire in the last month of the quarter. Yeah. I, I really got myself focused and I, I used to do a monthly thing because even when I was doing big deals, because yeah. you always get stuck in procurement and procurement was something that you didn't have a lot of control over. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it's one of the things when we, when we, when we take this cadence and we start to shorten it so that the sales organization can focus on producing consistent results instead of, you know, if you say you have a service delivery team, and we're on a quarterly cadence as far as communication between the sales manager and the salespeople. Well, many times, you know, that third month, March, it may be, you'll get a just a flush. 75% of your business for the quarter may come in. Yep. Well, it also creates additional constraints. And there's just there additional constraints on how to deliver that, right? Because you have these big peaks and these big valleys. Um, and then it also tends to, the other thing that happens with that quarterly cadence, besides the fact that you're more likely to miss your number, as my friend John Barrows says, you know, the end of the month or the end of the quarter, I mean, 
you just absolutely throw margin out the window as a salesperson because I know you're a big believer in relationships too. But across sales in general, they think price actually matters to that if they drop it by an extra few bucks at the end of the quarter or the month, that they'll actually get the deal done. And that's not an effective way to do it. And the problem becomes they don't get the deal in the quarter or the month they want it, but then they lowered the overall margin to the company too. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, there are a lot of things you're talking about the right. Yeah, it's hard to claw that back once it's out there, um, you know, especially with an intangible like technology or something that doesn't have a marginal cost and everybody knows it. Um, yeah. And what uh, are you seeing working today in, in sales? I mean, I'm sure you hear, you know, a bunch of whining, a bunch of um, <laughs> <laughs> from everybody, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think. Well, it's interesting, too. And now you talk to a lot of people and a lot of great sales leaders and a lot of consultants and trainers and folks like me. And I'll bet that you I, I'll say this phrase to you and I think it will resonate. All the problems that sales faces, regardless of organization size, are uniquely the same. You know, I tend to find that I go into organizations and when I work with companies, you know, they have some core things going on, right? That you've got to change the beliefs behind. You know, one of them is price matters the most, right? Oh, we're being commoditized by everybody else, right? That no. relates that they all believe that they have good business relationships. But when you or I, if we were to go in and talk to those uh, customers, as I've done, I find out they're well, they're actually business acquaintances, and that's why you can't get your referrals up and running. Um, so today, I think ultimately. This may sound silly, but I think it's almost I've almost adopted a legacy thinking, and that is do what everybody won't do. And so we really, really push on the idea of that trust, relationships and other centered approach are the things that matter most, because I don't think uh, many sales forces have lost the ability to understand what it is their prospect really desires and in today when the marketing tail is so long and they can find so much information that confuses them online if we can't ask ask better questions than our competitor then price is all that matters and i think there's been a real we've done sales a disservice to some extent because the one thing i found that works the best is what we do to expand conversations and most of the time, people only talk about open-ended, closed-ended, or clarifying questions. Yeah. But it's the it's the items in the middle where you get somebody to tell you more about why they feel a certain way. That's where the gold in the relationship and where you can actually move your price up because you're providing a service that's more valuable. So kind of a return to the old of we've got to find ways to build actual relationships. Um, and so there's some techniques that work to do that. So – What's your feeling on this division of labor kind of gone mad that uh, kind of the high velocity crowd? Uh, and I, I do think it belongs in certain companies that are in the tornado that have a tremendous amount of pull and that they're trying to deal with demand as opposed to trying yeah. to create demand. <laughs> um, sure. Are, are you finding it you're running into everybody wants to reduce commission expense versus increase top line revenue? Hmm. It's, an, it's an interesting question. I think what I run into is there's all of the information out there, I think, is really just confused companies. You know, so my core, the core set of clients that I have are sub a hundred million dollars. So still really solid ongoing entities, but, you know, but they're not the multi-billion dollar companies who already have all the demand just coming at them and they're trying to segment it. Um, and so when I look at those companies, there's a lot of confusion over, do I use an SDR model? Do I use a BDM model? Do I want to pay people for actual performance? Um, and then the thing that happens within those companies is they forget the key components. So right directly to your question about commissions and about top line performance, they forget that it's not a comp plan. It's a human behavior modification plan. And my sales force should be able to sit up in bed in the morning hold up their comp plan and know exactly what they're required to do in order to perform within my company. And unfortunately, I see time and time again, because we're trying to be responsible financially, that you get a comp plan that's overly complicated, that looks like it's got a whole bunch of money on the on the back end. Yep. <laughs> but not a single salesperson believes they're actually going to hit it. 
Yeah. And so it actually is de-incentivizing them. So I'd, I'd caution CFOs and COOs to understand that simple is better and that paying people for their performance and the hardest job in the world makes good business sense. And that's it. And I think we've really taken the wrong turn on that. Um, I'm not sure when you started, but when I did, I started, it was like 80% of the people would make their number. And and today yeah. it's closer to 50. And taking a job where it's like 50% likelihood of making that target income, which has continued to go up. But the problem is that right. they've, they've made it um, that only half do. And then there's a lot of the people on that half that uh, were lucky or got a good territory or the timing was right. And that builds a little bit of resentment uh, up in the team. Because if you work really hard and you don't make your number, um, it really impacts your career. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And sales are only as good as your you know, your last year's number. I don't think that's changed. You know, that I'm not 46. Changed, so. No. <laughs> right. So it's one of those things. You know, I would tell new salespeople when I was in a position to bring them on and they were working for me as a manager, I'd say, look, here's the deal. I'm going to change your life this year if you'll do the things that you're asked to do. Yeah. Right. Because of the idea they can, you know, they go from 30 to 65,000 and they're 26, you know, if they, they stay decided. the path. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's cool stuff. But yeah, I think you're, I think you're right. And there, you know, there's some people out there who are controversial who are talking about it. You know, Graham Hawkins talks about how the elimination of commissions out of it. He's out of Australia. But um, I think for companies who really get it, you've just got to tie it to the performance of the company. And the other thing you have to be OK with is having some people who just crush the number. I've seen too many times where they create a comp plan that brings up the pay for the bottom performers and actually de-incentivize the, uh, the top performers. And so we've just got to make sure that and if somebody kills it, let's go ahead and pay him because you want to keep that rock star around because it motivates the entire team. Right. You want to see that and hold it up because it helps you hire people. Uh, and then you don't want to do the, you know, divide that territory into three and ha keep handicapping that person until they can't make the money that they want. And then they go somewhere else. Um, yeah. And I, I'm just... I hear about companies that either get away with or try to get away with no commission. And what you get is a bunch of good soldiers who smile and nod and they're service people. They're not salespeople. They're not yeah. bloodthirsty. They, they're not the ones that are going to get up at four in the morning to jump on a plane. They're not going to lose sleep at night if the deal doesn't come in because they have no financial or emotional attachment to it. Yeah, and I think that's a, that brings up a second point of that too, right? So comp plan's a piece of it. And probably one of the biggest misnomers in all of sales management is that if I put a good comp structure in place, that that person will be, should be personally motivated, self-motivated. You know, and ultimately, as I've heard you as you've interviewed other guests, I agree with a couple of them where they've said, hey, look, now you've got to actually manage to the individual. And so... I think that's one of the places where sales managers miss it. They go, oh, well, hey, if they hit target, they yeah. can make a trillion dollars. Right. That should be enough. And then the sales manager goes, the sales manager, the VP, the business owner goes back in, buries their head in the computer, starts looking at reports, but forgets. You know, I'm a big believer that I think, quite frankly, everything comes back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. <laughs> and these <laughs> humans have a basic level of need. And the comp is just the thing that comes after we've satisfied those other needs to get them to perform. And what do you coach as far as looking for reps? I, you know, because I've had people on who are kind of experts in that area, and I kind of agree with some of the things as far as competitiveness, uh, the need to achieve, uh, and then the just the intellectual capacity to understand the business. Um, but I've seen people with either one of those things succeed or some people, with, you know, two of them succeed. Well, what profile do you find that is really working today? Well, let me challenge you for a second. I'll challenge those experts. Do those. I'm a big believer that words matter and they're precious. You know, and I, I believe the idea. I can't remember who said it, but I believe in the quote, if I had more time, I'd have written you a shorter letter. Yeah. And Mark the idea Twain. that, <laughs> yes, there you go. I knew it was obvious, but in the moment, there yeah. you can see I'm authentically stupid sometimes. So 
within within that particular idea, though, competitives. I want people who had an athletic background. I want them driven. I want them intellectual. But define that. Yeah. Those are those are things that you're going to assume just by looking at a resume. Those are not things that you can actually duplicate and repeat in your hiring process, which is why even in a 3.9 percent unemployment economy, sales turnover is still pretty high. So when I look at it, the very first thing that I'm looking looking at is I want to understand the job and the behaviors that I need them to do. Remember, we, we talked earlier about they have to do the basic behaviors. They have to do the basic things that's put in the work itself, and then I can make them great. Yeah. Right. So I'm looking at the behavior. So if it's a job where they have to go pull on doors every day, I want them to have been in a job previously, regardless of industry, where they had to go do that. If I have a high cadence or pace, if my turn, if my deal flow comes in and they're supposed to close 12 deals a, m- a month, I'm never going to hire somebody who only closed a deal a month. You know, and I don't and a lot of times it's not necessarily even going to be price reflective, right? It's not going to be industry reflective, but it's I'm trying to get to what does this person think success feels like? What have they experienced it as success in the past? And can I look at that and, and can they demonstrate it when I talk to them? Because my first interview is very, my first interview with most people. The agenda goes like this. Hey, appreciate you making time for me. This conversation is going to go between seven and 45 minutes. <laughs> And the reason that it's going to go between 7 and 45 is you or I will figure out it's a very bad fit in the next six minutes, or you or I will be interested enough to figure out what the next step may be at the end of 45 minutes. And you're looking for that match, the, 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 yep. the background that matches the current situation. Yeah, and I'm also looking – and the, the other big thing that I look for, because it's, I found that it doesn't exist in sales the way I believe it used to. But then again, you know, we all look back and everything was – we were better than everybody else when we were younger, right? Um, but I'm also looking, one of the, the most important trait I'm looking for, and this will be in any position in any industry for that's in, that's in sales. And that is curiosity. Yes. Yeah. If they can't get me to expand what I mean by a declarative statement as an example, Hey Ken, what do you think success looks like in this position? Well, success look. And then I say back to him, I go, oh, Brian, success looks like hitting quota. If they don't find a way to make me tell them more that's actual information that they can use in order to close me, then I don't have any desire for them to move on in the sales process. So there's, so when you move away from competitive and driven, I'm looking for the background match. I'm looking for are they naturally curious? And the last thing that I look for is can they be, an, can they be the teacher and the student on the same call? And that comes full circle back to change. I mean, you were talking in the article about change within the organization, but how about the ability of a rep to change and adapt and take feedback? Um, because I find a lot of them are very sensitive. Yeah, but I think it's the environment they've been brought up in. Yeah. Um, I think there's really, and statistics will show that this is true too, but I think there's a really significant gap and how sales managers and VPs and business owners are coached to be managers. Um, you know, and so as an example, when, when I'm teaching people, we talk about you have three different hats. You have a leadership hat, you have a management hat, and you have a coaching hat. Well, unfortunately, in most leadership environments, I think I'd say the vast majority of leaders are always managing. Yes. And they forget yeah. to coach and they forget to lead. And so... The very first thing that has to happen is that the VP, the executive, the entrepreneur, the CEO, they have to buy into the idea and then they have to show it with their walk that this is not just a passing fad. Because the other thing, that cultural rising, the, you know, their, their human brain, the fight or flight mechanism is saying, OK, sure, you're interested in me today, but tomorrow your priorities will change. So if I just weather this, I don't have to change anything. You know, and as humans, we don't want to change. So I think it starts with sales leadership and then it moves to sales. But you because you have to set the example. um, And yes, it doesn't happen in a day. But if you commit to it, the outcome is unbelievable. Excellent. Hey, this has been a great conversation, Ken. Where do people go to learn about you, connect with you and uh, learn about your company? Perfect. Yeah, they can go to Ken Lundin, which is L-U-N-D-I-N dot com. Glad to connect with people on uh, LinkedIn. I'm a heavy user just as as you are. Um, and then I think at the, by the point time this comes out, we will actually have had a, my book out 
I'm part of a co-contributors or co-authors in a book called Purpose, Passion, and Profit. And so Kyle Wilson, who was a Jim Rohn's 18-year business partners in it, Robert Helms was the number one real estate podcast. It's just a great collection of sales and thought leaders. So um, that'll be something. So KenLundin.com, connect with me on LinkedIn or social media. And Brian, I really appreciate the conversation. This has been a blast. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that. Ken's a great guy, great perspective on things. And that ownership capability and mindset is really a differentiator between B and A players. It's so easy in sales to come up with reasons why it's not working. There's so many of them. <laughs> That's our problem. It's the people who kind of, you know, run through that. Instead of running through just the rejection and the uh, kind of the, the pushback that you get, run through that. Uh, that ownership that I own it and it really comes to the the thing that I'm kind of on right now is that knowledge is not enough in sales you know you can listen to comedians 24 7 doesn't make you funny you can watch cooking shows you know for eight hours a day doesn't make you a good cook you may know what it is you may have studied it until you do it and sales is a doing it profession Knowledge is probably the 20%, 80% of it is doing it. And that's what I'm trying to build into the classes is the do it, share your work, get some feedback all anonymously. Nobody knows who you are, what you do, who you sell to. Don't be shy. And the people who are getting the most out of the classes are really the people who are digging into it, showing their work, listening to what other people are getting. And understand that you know different channels work for different people. Uh, different approaches work for different people. But if you get these ideas, try it and and change it, share it, get feedback. Because the difference between good and great is usually just one or two words or even deleting some stuff. But the difference in results is 50 to 100 grand a year. So that's the ROI we want. And I ask you one question. Are you making the money you want? Are you making the 500 to a million dollars a year in complex selling? If you're not, you can. You can look around, check it out on the internet. You can look in your industry what the salaries are and look at that high end. Let's get you to that high end if it's what you want. And the way to do it is not going to be reading a book. It's not, you know, the podcast will help, you know, it entertains you. It kind of gives you some different perspectives. It's good. You know, that's why I do it. I love doing it. But until you do it, and I get this all the time, I'm like, I'm the same way. You know, the first thing in the morning, I, I get up and I like, I look at my list and I'm like, oh, can't I do some of the fun stuff? Can't I just listen to a podcast? Can't I just, you know, laugh and, you know, just get on social media for a while. I go, no, nope, I know the most important thing. And it's a grind, but if you do it, the results happen and you do it every day. So check out the courses at b2brevenue.com under training. And let me give you an overview because I, I will get on the phone with you, but not to answer the obvious questions. There's a video courses. The content is video and there's a, every other week is a meetup which I call office hours. It's open to everybody in the course. You can ask any question in between office hours at any time via email. I make a video response to any and all questions, either through office hours or through a separate video. If it applies to everybody, I'll, I'll put it into office hours. If there's not enough time, I'll make a separate video. So it's like having sales coaching. It's not one-on-one, -on -one, it's one-to-many. So there's a distinction there. But for a year, you get this transition to be able to show what you do, get feedback. I show you what I do, what I've seen work, you know, through my years and through really the last five years of training companies. The patterns have been very similar. And this is why I went digital was that, you know, why do I need to go to a location? I'd rather sit down with the reps who want to learn who want to own it, who really want to become better and help them through that journey. And if you don't want to go on that journey, that's up to you. If you think knowledge is enough, um, I think you look at your W-2. Look at that paycheck. Are you number one or number two in the company? If you're not, you got room. Uh, sales is no, the B player. The middle class of sales is sinking and shrinking and 
not going to get paid the way it used to. So check that out at b2brevenue.com. You get a free ebook there. Last week, I announced a contest that I'm having by the end of August, the last day of August, whoever shares uh, a screenshot of the podcast tags as many people as possible, gets the most number of comments by the end of August, will get a $100 uh, Amazon gift card. Did I say 100 or 150 I'm going to keep up in it. You know, so by the end of August, it'll be a great reward. And it also will teach you about social selling and the power of sharing on LinkedIn. Uh, make sure you tag me so I see it and I'll share it and help you promote it, obviously, because it helps me. Uh, but let me help you help me and help you again and pay you back for or reward you for spreading the word about the brutal truth that's it uh make sure you're checking out the other podcasts i'm going almost daily on the sales questions podcast so i I get riffing on answers there and what i'm seeing and answering questions for you so you can just email them to me at brian g burns at me.com or just on linkedin just connect up with me and email me a question i'll get that answered on that podcast uh as it makes sense i do it based off of applicability to the most number of people Thanks for listening. Make sure you check out the show notes for all the links to our partners. Use the coupon code BRUTALTRUTH at both Pipedrive and Nudge. Check out the blogs at gong.io and discover.org. Great stuff going on there. And if you're not using video, this is the year of video. Go to covideo.com. Give it a shot. See how video email can change your effectiveness and crushing it and being able to communicate and connect with others.